like here at Heart and Soul? What's the vision moving forward? In week one, we talked about how we're going to be a church that goes into the night. We're going to be a church that prays for our lost friends and family, people that don't know Jesus every single day. We're going to be people that invite others to church, but also share our story every single week. We're going to be people here at Heart and Soul that get engaged and equipped right here in this building and in this body, moving outside of the four walls of this auditorium, of this school. And then in week number two, we talked about digging some ditches. Y'all remember that one? We're digging ditches uh, because the Lord is going to send the rain and we want to be prepared to be used by him when he does. And this week we are wrapping it up. Look at your neighbor and say, we wrapping. All right. Okay. That was weak sauce. All right. Do it again. Look at your other neighbor, your other neighbor and say, we wrapping. Okay. All right. Cool. 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 All right. All right. So we're wrapping it up today. And uh, this Sunday we are talking about, for all of you type A people that need a title for the sermon, okay? It is harvest time. Harvest time. Man, yeah. All right. A few people are excited about that. It's because you've never been a farmer, okay? <laughs> harvest is the hard part. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, last month when Sarah's family moved here, uh, they moved from Maryland, not Maryville, okay, Maryland, uh, up north, down south to the promised land of Knoxville, Tennessee, somebody, the big 865, yeah. Uh, when they moved to Knoxville, we discovered a photo. <laughs> we discovered a photo of Sarah as a child. Now, before... That gets thrown up on the screen, okay? Before that gets thrown up on the screen, it's a series of photos, a compilation, if you will, okay? Did it get thrown up already? All right, a compilation, if you will, of photos of Sarah. And um, before that gets thrown up there, let me just let you know uh, that this is, in fact, Sarah, my wife, and it is not my oldest son with a wig on. Um, because they look identical. It is scary. I think I had something to do with it, uh, you know, but... Um, I did, right? Okay, thanks. Uh, <laughs> in front of everybody, therapy session. Okay, let's go. Uh, so this picture of Sarah is, um, uh, I love it. Okay, let's just go ahead and show it, throw it up there real quick. Look at that. Look at that little girl. Wow, okay. Look at her. Okay. This is not Photoshopped. <laughs> that is a real something or another. Um, so is that one down there. Like, that's a, that, that, I don't know. I think this is just a mistake. I don't know what that one, <laughs> she was trying to do something else and uh, we need wireless packs, okay? Get that off the ground. Um, somebody, somebody today is gonna give us some money to get wireless, no. Uh, so, so that's Sarah, okay? And, uh, and Sarah and I, we went over to watch a football game uh, with uh, some friends that we've made through our party here at Heart and Soul, okay? Hey, if you don't have friends and you're not in a party, can't help, can't help you, okay? Uh, join a party today. It's going to be awesome. Now, we, we met these people at our party here at Heart and Soul, what we call our small groups here, and uh, we went over to watch the football game, and about halfway through, the girls got bored of the football game, and um, at halftime, just a little aside, uh, me and my guy Brandon, okay, uh, we, uh, we went and played Madden, and he beat me in the first quarter, like 56 to 7. And I was playing with the Cowboys, though. So there it is. Um, and, and so we go back, we go back, right, to, to watch the football game. The ladies get bored, and so they decide, after seeing this photo, that they are going to recreate... Sarah's poses, but today, okay, and, um, and so here's the results of Sarah redoing these poses um, next to her old poses, throw, go ahead and throw that up there, okay, <laughs> okay, so, so, um, this one right here, <laughs> I mean, goodness, Babe, you know what? This one right here, you killed it though. So good. I mean, identical. Just so good. So good. Um, this one right here, she said, this was, this was the funny part. And she said, hey, if I, if I tell you to stop, the code word is going to be stop, okay? That's going to be like 
the, the, the safe word, okay? And if I tell you to stop, that means stop bending my back like you're breaking it. And, and so we start to I hold her legs and I'm pushing, pushing back on her legs to try to get her to, to do this, to make her do that, okay? And I'm pushing on her legs and she never says stop. She just goes, hey, oh, hey, oh. And then we stop, I, then I finally stop and she's like, why didn't you stop? And I was like, you didn't say stop. I don't, and, and uh, yeah, so honestly though, she did great, right? Like, can we give it up for Sarah? Like, 100% accuracy. <laughs> Uh, and you know, honestly, like that wasn't, that wasn't half bad for not having done that for literally 20 years. Like not having done it for 20 years, she didn't prepare, nothing. She just went straight into it. And honestly, like, let's be real. Like no wonder, <laughs> no wonder it didn't line up perfectly from what it was 20 years ago. Sarah hasn't stretched since we've been married. <laughs> and... It, it wasn't exactly perfect. And I think, honestly, that's what happens with us a lot of times spiritually. A lot of times people come to know Jesus and there's this passion for the Lord at the very beginning. In fact, biblically speaking, you might call this zeal for the Lord. Ah, I come to know Jesus, my life has changed. And man, you know what? Every time the doors are open to the church, I'm there. And every person I know that doesn't know Jesus, I'm telling them about Jesus because I got this passion, I got this zeal for the Lord that my life was changed and somebody else's life can be changed. And what happens in our lives is we have this compassion and we have this burden and we have this zeal to reach more people at the beginning. And that compassion and that burden get this, starts to wane the longer that you're a Christian. Have you noticed this? Where you come to know Christ and it's just like, man, God can do anything. If he could save me, he could save anybody. God could use me. God can do anything. If he can work through me, baby, he can work through you. We have this passion and this zeal for the Lord at the beginning and it starts to taper off the longer we're a Christian. Why is that? Why is it that that happens to so many people? I think mostly because the West, and when I talk about the West, I'm talking about like America and the, 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 the West bringing in and coming into Christianity has taught us in every area of life, get this, that you have to prepare before you are able or allowed to perform. That you have to prepare before you are allowed to perform. So we think that we've come to Jesus, and now that we know Jesus, that now we have to prepare before we can perform. Now that I've come to know Jesus, I have to get my life together before God can use me. Now that I've come to know Jesus, I have to learn all there is to learn about theology before I can share my story and share Jesus with somebody else. That we have to learn and soak in and know everything before we can be used by God to reach other people. Now the problem with waiting till you know enough to share with your family, to share with your friend, friends, is that the longer you wait, the further from salvation you get naturally, naturally the curse of knowledge starts to set in, doesn't it? Is that you forget what it was like to not know Jesus. You forget what it was like to, to not have peace. You forget what it was like to not have joy. You forget what it was like to not know Jesus. And you've been with Jesus and you've been around church people and you've been around church folk and you've been in church and you get so separated from what you needed at the beginning that it's hard to remember and reach the people that you're with today. And this is not just a pastor thing. This is not just an old Christian thing. I think that this is everybody. I think all of us can fall into this trap where we have the curse of knowledge start to set in. And, and honestly, we think that if we know enough, then we'll be able to share enough. If we know more theology, we'll be more effective. That's not wrong. It's just not the full picture. A lot of times, a lot of times, we think that if we know more scripture, we'll be more effective. Not wrong, just not the full picture. 
A lot of times in our life, we wait and we wait and we wait and we learn and we learn until we've lost the compassion it takes to reach somebody that doesn't know Jesus. We've lost the burden that we had at the beginning. Because, get this, when you first come to Jesus, you, I don't know about y'all, but when I first came to Jesus, I was so grateful, so grateful for the person that shared Jesus with me. The person that shared Jesus with me was like this, this 125-year-old old man, okay? Like he was on the ark with Noah. Like this dude was old. He was, he was with Moses at the beginning, okay? Like this dude, this cat was super old, and I was just so grateful that God would use him. I was so grateful that I saw that he had a small Bible. I went and got a small Bible. I carried that small Bible with me in middle school, everywhere I went, every single day at school. And I would open up that Bible and I would share Jesus as a middle school student straight in the middle of the school. And the longer I came to know Jesus and the longer I was a Christian, the harder that became. Because at the beginning you have zeal, at the beginning you have passion, at the beginning you know what it's like not to know Jesus. And we end up looking in a lot of, in a lot of ways, kind of like Sarah trying to do all her poses from childhood. We've waited so long to share our story or to invite our friends or to tell somebody about what Jesus has done in your life that oftentimes we forget what it was like to be the person that needed it so desperately. If we're not careful, we can forget what it was like before we came to Heart and Soul Church and someone told us about Jesus and how desperate you were that day that if you weren't invited to Heart and Soul, that you didn't know what was going to come next, but God met you here and God changed your life here. We can forget what it's like to not know Jesus if we wait too long to share Jesus. In fact, there's a story in Scripture that helps us to see some of this, how we can recapture burden, how we can recapture compassion, again, from the beginning. And this passage of scripture that we're gonna read today is going back and it's looking at where Jesus gathers his disciples together, okay, like this is Jesus, the Son of God. We believe here at Heart and Soul that Jesus, okay, Jesus was born of a Virgin Mary, that Jesus lived a perfect life, and that Jesus did his ministry life for three years on the planet, and in three years, Jesus changed all of the world. And that Jesus died on the cross and then that Jesus got up out of the tomb on the third day to give you a fresh start, to give you a new life. And now today he has the, the keys to death, hell, and the grave that he's ready to give to you. And this same Jesus we see in Matthew chapter 9 gathering his disciples and he's telling them what he's wanting them to do. In fact, I believe that it's not just telling them, I think he's telling us as well. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 through 38 says this. Jesus went through all of the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had, keyword there, compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. You know, I think we do a lot of times as Christians, as believers, I think a lot of times we're asking the Lord to bring a harvest when the Lord asked us to bring workers. We're asking the Lord, hey, Lord, would you, would you bring a harvest in our life? God, would you change people? Would you save people? That's great. But the Lord is waiting on us to step up and start asking him to send workers into the field. In fact, I think, I think a lot of times we pray prayers to the Lord. And, and what we don't realize is that God is on the other side of that prayer waiting on you to be the answer to the prayer you're praying to him. God, would you bring a harvest? God, would you bring workers? See, Jesus went through all of the towns and all of the villages proclaiming the kingdom of God. And I, I just want to pause here for just a minute and just let you know 
that just like Jesus went through all the towns, Jesus went through all the villages, we believe here at Heart and Soul Church that, that we are going to be and we are going to reach and be a regional church in East Tennessee to reach more and more and more and more and more people. Not for numbers, not for growth, not for those things. We're going to reach more people because that's what Jesus did. Jesus went to all the villages. He went to all the towns. So we are not satisfied with Bearden High School. We are satisfied when God has given us and he has used us to fill heaven right from Knoxville, Tennessee. We, we want to be a church that's reaching more and more people. Why? Because that's exactly what Jesus was about. See, it wasn't just about his disciples. <laughs> it wasn't just about us four and no more. It wasn't just about the 12. It was about everyone else as well. It wasn't just about the people that were with him in his immediate circle, but it was also about the hurting and the helpless and the harassed, those that were like sheep without a shepherd, those that didn't know him yet. It's why here at Heart and Soul, we, we don't apologize for trying to reach more people. That's why we don't apologize every single Sunday when I stand up here and I give people an opportunity to come to know Jesus. We're not waiting on Easter for you to come to know Jesus. <laughs> every Sunday here is Easter. And somebody said amen to that. Amen. We're not waiting on Easter. We believe that God can change people today. We believe that God, let me just pause here for a second. We believe that God cannot just change people today. We believe that God can use you to reach somebody on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday. If you know the days of the week, join me. On Friday, on Saturday, and yes, on Sunday. Some of y'all need that song, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. He'll save them if we tell them all about his grace. I made that up. Let's go. <laughs> On the spot, baby. I should be in the writing team. Okay. We believe God can save people. He can change people. And what's funny about this passage of scripture, how he says they're, he, they're, the people are harassed and they're helpless like sheep without a shepherd. What's funny about that is in terms of 2022, you don't have to look very far to find someone who is helpless or harassed, do you? In fact, you could look to your left or your right today and you could probably find somebody today that's helpless and harassed. In fact, there's people all in our world that lack direction, that lack clarity. They're living a nine to five with no purpose in their life. You know what makes it so easy in 2022 to tell this is because most people in our world cannot tell the difference between a Facebook post and a private journal entry. <laughs> Stepping on some toes, okay. <laughs> Now, is there wisdom in that? Probably not. But it's helpful that, to those that know Jesus. It's helpful to us because now we know how to help. We, we know how to help. We know how to be used by God. We know how to direct people towards Jesus. It's why our next series coming up after the Super Bowl is uh, Google Says. We are looking at the biggest questions that people Googled in the year 2021 to try to answer biblically what people are actually asking. You know what the church is really good at? The church is really good at answering questions that nobody's asking. But we want to be a church that's really good at answering questions that everybody's asking. So you don't want to miss that series. Shameless plug. <laughs> the whole idea, the whole idea for this passage is wrapped around the harvest and the workers. The harvest and the workers. Now, let me get a little theological. Look at your neighbor and say, get ready. <laughs> Half of y'all are like, I don't know if I want to hear this. Okay. <laughs> that God controls and God brings the harvest. Watch this. But that we should get to work. That God controls and brings the, the harvest, but we control and should get to work. 
Theologically speaking, I think that this passage, I believe this passage shows us a glimpse of what we see all throughout the scripture. Watch this, okay? This idea that God is sovereign. And watch this. And we are responsible. <laughs> God is sovereign. We are responsible. See, the harvest, I think it tells us that God is sovereign. That God is sovereign. I, here at Heart and Soul, I have never in my life saved a single person. I have people that come up to me after they've given their life to Christ and like, man, God used you today. Like, you saved me. You saved me. Whoa, time out, time out. Back up. I didn't save you. Jesus saved you. It, it, the Lord is the Lord of the harvest. He's sovereign. God does what God does. I don't change lives. I don't save people. I don't resurrect souls. That is God's job, and he is sovereign and in control enough to see people come to him and change their life. God changes people's lives. But watch this. Watch this. The work, the work is also that we are responsible. See, what I do... It's my responsibility to bring the gospel to people. Watch this. This is what Paul says. To be an ambassador of Christ. To be a communicator of the Great Commission. Paul says it this way. How will they believe if they don't hear? How will they hear if someone doesn't tell them? Listen to me. We are responsible. We are responsible. We are responsible. We, we could get into all kinds of theological arguments over the sovereignty of God versus the free will of man. And I did that for four years in college at Liberty University. I'm telling you, every freshman comes on campus of a Christian college knowing exactly where the line is between God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. And they're all full of it. <laughs> and that, none of them know. We could get in all kinds of arguments. I could talk to you all day about it. But what I have come to realize is that God is sovereign to save people. And I am responsible to tell them. That if I don't tell them, how will they hear the word? And if they don't hear the word, how will they come to know him? I'm responsible. I'm responsible. Let me, let me illustrate it this way. Um, I, I've, I've been on Facebook for a long time, okay? And the most annoying season of being on Facebook has been the recent season, okay? Most of January and, and most of this month as well, my Facebook has looked like giant squares of green and yellow and black. Does anybody else's Facebook look like this? Go ahead and throw that up there real quick. Yep. Anybody else's Wordle? Any, does anybody in here play Wordle? Okay, all right. Woo. Praise the Lord. Okay. Wordle. Okay, look. This is this is literally this is me. I'm, when I first saw Wordle all over social media, I was like, "What in the world are these green boxes?" Okay, what is happening here with Wordle? And uh, it was annoying me because every post was like Wordle. I was like, "Mute for 30 days. Mute for 30 days." Okay. Let me, let me put it aside here as well. Did you know, did you know that you don't have to listen to people on Facebook? Did you know that you could unfriend them? And if you're just too nice of a person to unfriend them, did you know that there's three little dots, you can click those and you can mute them for 30 days? Isn't that crazy? I do it all the time, all the time. You think I'm kidding. Like some of y'all are muted right now, okay? <laughs> I do it all the time. Why? Because I have, I, man, I, I, like, I need some mental health, okay? Like, I, I cannot listen to all of this junk that's coming through social media. And Wordle started to become the junk I was seeing on social media. Now, here's how Wordle works. This is according to Jimmy Fallon, so I could get it wrong, okay? Wordle, from what my research came about, is Wordle uh, is this game where you guess letters, right? And you're trying to find this one word, and the one word is in all green, apparently. And if I've been this wrong, like, see me at the after party. Don't say it now. Um, <laughs> and you're trying to guess this one word with five letters on Wordle. And what I came to realize about Wordle is that 
You can choose any of the letters in the alphabet. But the creator of Wordle knows exactly what the word is. The creator of Wordle knew the word before the word was given out that day for Wordle, but you didn't know that word. So you had to actually go in and act and you had to choose a letter and you had to choose a word and you had to choose the things that you were going to say about the word. And I believe, I believe that God is very similar is that God is sovereign and he knows all things, but just because he knows the beginning from the end doesn't mean that there isn't space in the middle to go left, right, or straight. That while God may know it all and he's, he's all-knowing and omnipresent and he's everywhere at once, God knows it, listen to me, it does not negate my responsibility and your responsibility to share his word with others. See, the Bible is full of God's sovereignty at work with, get this, so important, an invitation from God for us to be a part of the execution of his plan. The Bible is full of this. You you almost never in the scripture see God not use people. Almost never. God uses people to reach people. God could have done it all by himself, but instead he chooses to use me and he chooses to use you. Why? Because we are responsible. We are responsible. God's sovereignty never gives us permission to be irresponsible. Hello. (laughs) See, we need to learn to rest in the results as if God knows what he's doing. Let me give you an example of this. Resting in the results that God knows what he's doing. Don't get all messed up when you share your story or you share Jesus or you invite somebody to church and watch this, they don't come. God knows what he's doing. Don't get all upset when you share your story about how God has changed your life and they look back at you and they say, okay, cool. God knows what he's doing. Don't get messed up when things don't go your way. Why? Because we believe that God is sovereign. But get this, this is so important. We have to work while we can as if we are responsible. Because we are. Because we are. We are responsible to use what God has given us to use. How else will they hear unless we tell them? How else will we hear, they hear unless we tell them? So the question is, okay, well then how does, how does that work? How does that work? God is sovereign, we are responsible, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. God wants to save people, but he's waiting on us to get to work. He's waiting on us to get to work. If you're taking notes, write this down. Saved people serve people. God is sovereign, God is sovereign, okay? God does the saving, but we bring the buckets. We tell them about Jesus. I've never saved anybody, but I can tell somebody about Jesus, that he died and that he resurrected, that you don't have to live in your shame anymore. You don't have to live in your guilt anymore. You don't have to live in the regret anymore. You can live a new life in Jesus Christ. I tell them that, and then God does the saving. Save people, serve people. What is it to work in the harvest field? To work is to serve. See, work is active, and so is serving. In fact, I I don't know that you can serve without a little sweat. (laughs) I don't know that you can really serve and say you've served without a little sweat. I tell our volunteers, what we call heaven bringers here at Heart and Soul, uh, all the time I tell people, man, you know what? If you don't leave on a Sunday with a little sweat, then maybe you didn't serve enough. We have a great opportunity here at Heart and Soul because we set up and tear down. So like your boy's been been sweating since 6 a.m. Like, (laughs) amen. And he's been sweating <laughs> since 6 a.m. It's a joke mostly, but there's truth there too. There's something about serving up a sweat that impacts you as much as it impacts the people that you're serving. I don't know if you've ever been on a mission trip, or if you've ever served people, if you've ever gone downtown under the bridge and you, you've served all kinds of different areas that our, our city has opportunities, our church has opportunities, our world obviously has opportunities, but most times I've ever served, I've ended up being the one to get more out of it than the people I've been serving. And, and this is not something we do as Christians, this is just who we are. Is that save people, serve people. 
You, you can't help but serve somebody. Why? Because the God of the universe laid down his life and served me. Who am I not to serve somebody else? Whether it be at my workplace, whether it be at my church, whether it be in my city, I'm going to serve people. Today might be the day like, for you to get signed up at our outreach area to go serve somebody. Might be the day that you get signed up today on our app to start serving on a Sunday morning. We are serving and we're opening up hearts for the gospel to be proclaimed over them so that the Lord can save their life. The people that are serving in the parking lot today as every one of us came on campus, the people that are serving at the doors, the people that are serving in kids right now, you know what they're doing? They are helping to prepare an atmosphere. They are helping to prepare hearts and souls and minds to hear about Jesus. If you serve here, it is not insignificant that you serve. It is significant because you are helping people get to Jesus, save people, serve people. Number two, save people are sacrificial people. If they're working in the field, they're missing out on something else. If they're going to the field to work, they're missing out on what they could be doing. See, there are sacrifices to be made to make much of Jesus. That there are, yes, things that intersect, but sometimes there are also sacrifices you have to make to follow Jesus. There are sacrifices that you may have made financially to follow Jesus. There are sacrifices that you may have made relationally to follow Jesus. There are sacrifices you may have made in your education or in your workplace or wherever to follow Jesus. But all of us have to learn to make sacrifices for him. Saved people are sacrificial people. Number three, saved people are sent people. Saved people are sent people. The workers are going into the harvest because they've been sent into the harvest. In fact, if you want to get technical with me, in the Greek, what we see here as sent out is actually more closely aligned to being forced out. Almost this feel that if you're praying that God would throw people out there, that, that's, I, I strongly believe that, that you should lead and you should serve even before you feel ready. A lot of people, we wait until we've been prepared enough to start serving somebody else. We wait until we've been prepared enough till we start sharing with somebody. We wait until we feel like we have enough answers for people before we start inviting people to come to church with us. But listen to me, listen to me. It's not as much about preparation as it is just about taking action. Just take an action, just take an action because saved people are sent people. Saved people are sent people. I think if we aren't careful, reading Matthew chapter 9 in our 21st century English Bibles, that we might just miss a lot of the story that God is trying to tell us. I think this happens a lot of times. We, we, we read something and maybe you're in a Bible reading plan. That's awesome. I hope you are. But a lot of times we'll read Matthew chapter 9 one day and then we'll read Matthew chapter 10 the next and we've already forgotten what Matthew chapter 9 was. And in the original language, in the original Greek, there was just one long manuscript. There weren't chapters and versed up and it wasn't all marked up. It didn't have categories. It didn't have any of that. It was a long story. And what happens oftentimes is we will read Matthew chapter 9 and we won't realize that Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is still connecting to Matthew chapter 9. Because if you read Matthew 9 without reading Matthew 10, you'll miss some of the best part of what Jesus is teaching. Because Jesus, get this, Jesus is telling his disciples to pray for workers, yes, to get into the field, yes, but then Jesus does something that is just such a great, like it's just a great leadership tactic. Jesus doesn't just teach something. He turns around and he sets up a leadership lab. He turns around and he says, all right, I just said for you to pray for workers. Now, watch this, watch this, Matthew chapter 10. Now, here's what you're gonna do, is now you're going to go answer the prayer that you just prayed and be the workers. He gathers the disciples together. In chapter 10, he makes them the answer to the prayers of workers. This is what he does. And what I like to call, okay, watch this. What I like to call quickly the nine after nine. The nine things Jesus says after chapter nine that I think that he's still saying to us today. 
The nine after nine. Nine things Jesus did when sending out workers, because if you just read chapter nine without chapter 10, you might just pray for workers. When Jesus didn't just pray for workers, he prayed and then he made them the answer to the prayer almost immediately. The nine after nine. Number one is go to people. Go to people. Chapter 10, verse six says this, go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Go to the lost sheep of Israel. Listen to me. As people at Heart and Soul Church, we should be all about going to the lost people of Knoxville. We should be all about reaching more people. A lot of us, we want to begin by traveling way off and we want to begin by going to, on a mission trip to Indonesia or Africa or wherever. Listen to me, there's enough lost people to go around in Knoxville. Why don't we start here first and then yes, let's go to the nations, but who, wh- why would we think that God wants to use us across the seas when we won't get in our own backyard? We need to learn to go to people, to go to people, to go to people. To reach people. Number two is find people. Find people. Verse 11 says this, whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. This is what I think this is saying in the 21st century is, hey, you need to find some people of peace. You know what a person of peace is? A person of peace is someone that has influence, maybe outside of your circle, that if you reach them, you'll reach a lot more people. If you'll reach Get this, if you'll reach the captain of the football team, you'll probably reach the football team. If you'll reach the boss at work, you'll probably reach the workplace. We should go find people of peace. Number three is very simple, speak anyway. Speak anyway, Don't don't worry that you don't know enough. Verse 19 says this, but when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say for it will not be you speaking but the spirit of your father speaking through you the spirit will speak through you the right words will be there the spirit of your father will supply the right words if you've given your life to Christ get this you have a story and you can speak and the Lord will speak through your story that when you don't feel like you know enough, when you feel like you don't got enough going on, you feel like you don't, you're not prepared enough, listen to me. If all you've got is your story of how God saved your life, that story is enough for God to use. His spirit will speak through you. Number next is don't quit. This is the big one. Don't quit. Verse 22 says, you'll be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Don't quit. Don't quit. This is so easy for us, isn't it? So easy for us to quit. When, when we invite someone to church or we tell somebody about Jesus and they say, nah, bro, not for me. It's so easy for us to say, oh, okay, quit, done, over. When people ignore you or they say no, ask again until they are so annoyed that they finally come to church and go ahead and buy them cheddars while you're at it. Go ahead and take them out afterwards. Let me give you a quick little story, okay? I don't know if y'all saw uh, Faith, okay? Faith, is Faith in here? Faith, oh, there she is, right up front. Faith, run around with the camera. Faith has done pretty much anything or everything here at Heart and Soul. She's been involved with guest services. She, she led our entire kids area. She now uh, is three weeks in to knowing how to take uh, photos, like has never done this in her life before and is slaying it right now, doing amazing, taking photos here at Heart and Soul. Now, let me tell you a short story about, about Faith. Faith and her husband, Johnny, moved here to Knoxville, Tennessee to be a part of Heart and Soul to help us start it in March of 2020. I don't know if y'all remember March of 2020, but March of 2020 was, it's over, right? And Faith and Johnny moved here, but before Faith and Johnny moved here, Faith and Johnny were a part of a church that we were a part of that my dad started called Soul Quest in Jackson, Tennessee. And Faith, um, what's it called when you cut hair? Beautician? Cosmetologist, okay. Uh, Faith was a cosmetologist and she went to cosmetology school. She went to cosmetology school with my sister, Madison. And Madison the worship leader at Soul Quest and Madison and Faith became friends and they would have Taco Bell for lunch like every day. And while they were eating, Madison 
would invite faith, what, almost every day, right? Invite faith to church every day. You coming this week? No. You coming this week? I don't like Jesus. You come, no, I, I don't want to be there. No. You coming this week? No. You coming this week? No. She did this for a long time until finally faith shows up at Soul Quest Church. Madison never gave up. So many of us are so easy to give up. But listen to me, who in your life is a faith that needs somebody to just keep asking, to just keep asking, to just keep asking, and then see what God can do through them? See, if Madison would have given up, faith may not be here today. Some of you have been impacted eternally by the ministry that Faith and Johnny have done in your life personally. And if Madison would have given up on faith, imagine where you might be today. See, I think everybody here has a faith. Everybody here has somebody in your life that maybe you gave up on them, but it's time to renew the commitment to say, you know what? If they say no a hundred more times, I'm gonna ask them a hundred more times. Don't quit. Number next, be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. Don't invite somebody to church. Don't tell them about your savior and then turn around and treat them like you follow Jesus or follow Satan. Man, we're so good at that, aren't we? At telling somebody, yeah, you should come check out our church. And then they check out your Facebook. And your Facebook doesn't look like Jesus. They, they, you tell them about your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then they hear you getting your kid from the, from the school. And they hear you cussing out your kid. And your life doesn't look like Jesus. Let's be people that are consistent to show Jesus to the world. Let's be like Jesus. Next is don't fear, don't fear. Jesus said, do not be afraid of them. Do not be afraid of them. Do not be afraid of them. See, here in a few weeks after our Google series, we're doing an afterlife series and I'm excited about that because we're gonna talk about the judgment seats at the end. And there, there's nothing in this world you should be afraid of, but there is some things that you should be afraid of after this world. Because we like to tell each other that, hey, don't judge me, only God can judge me. And that's the most dangerous thing you can ever say because yes, God will judge you. Now, if you've come to know Jesus, he's imputed righteousness to you. And so now you, when, when, when God looks at you, God sees the righteousness of Christ. But there's another judgment seat that we're gonna talk about where God judges what you did with what he gave you. And if there's people in your life that don't know him, those are the people, they are your responsibility. There are people in your circle that will never be in my circle. They are your responsibility, not mine. There are people in my circle that won't be in yours. They are my responsibility, not yours. We should be people. We should be people that don't fear. Our world is full of enough fear. We should be people that charge into the storm. We don't run away. Number seven, we should point people to Jesus. Jesus says, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. We point people to Jesus. It's always to Jesus. It's only to Jesus. The way, the truth, the life that no man comes to the Father except through him and you're coming and you're going and you're working and you're playing in all the ways, acknowledge him. That Jesus is the reason we're here at your gym, at your coffee shop, at your workplace, on the road, we point people back to Jesus. If Jesus did not die and rise again, we ought to pack all this up, sell it all and get out of the church business because it does not matter if Jesus is not resurrected and at the, the right hand of the Lord today. We wanna point people back to Jesus. Jesus says a famous verse in chapter 10, verse 39, whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. When you follow Jesus, you find life. When you follow Jesus, you find growth you've been looking for. It doesn't say that when you find Jesus that you'll find a pay increase. It doesn't say that you'll find a problem-free life. It says that you will find life in Him, in Him, in Him. 
finally, last but not least, verse 40, anyone who welcomes me, anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. See, we bring Jesus everywhere we go. We ought to bring Jesus everywhere we go. See, if you'll bring Jesus to people, watch this, they'll get Jesus. If I'll bring Jesus to people, they'll get Jesus. Don't just bring your arguments to people. Instead, bring Jesus to people. The problem with a lot of Christians is that we talk about Jesus, but we don't bring Jesus with us. We talk about how he changed our lives, but our lives don't look like he's changed our lives. Why? Because we leave Jesus at the altar at church on Sundays instead of bringing him everywhere we go. Our lives should be marked by how we love Jesus and how we love other people. Our lives should be marked by bringing Jesus everywhere we go. That's why one of our core values here at Heart and Soul is that we bring our own weather. We bring our own weather. Everywhere that I go, everywhere you go, it shouldn't be based on personality. It's not based on personality. It's about walking into a room, and when you walk into the room, the room gets better. Why? Not because you walked into the room, but because you brought Jesus into the room with you. When you walk into the room, if somebody needs peace, guess what, baby? I got it in my back pocket. Why? Because I've got the Holy Spirit of God living on the inside of me. I'm going to bring it everywhere I go. Oh, you need some joy? I've got an abundance of joy. I'm overflowing in joy because of what God has done in my life. Oh, oh, you need some peace. You need some joy. You need some love in your life. I've got that. Why? Because I've got Jesus. Not because of me, but because of him. See, God is sovereign to save people, but we are responsible to tell people. And if we don't tell them, and if we don't invite them, and if we don't share with them, how will they come to know the Jesus that you know, the Jesus that I know? Here's my prayer over every single person here today as we wrap up. My prayer over every single person here, and you may have said this, this is an old kind of preacher saying, my prayer over you is a Bob. A Bob. That you would get a burden God would send you an opportunity that you would have boldness in that opportunity. That the Lord would burden your heart so strongly about your lost friends that don't know Jesus. And then that the Lord would set an opportunity before you and you would have boldness to step into it to share your story with somebody else. I have a Bob today. Every head bowed and every eye closed.